Hello everyone, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. Really happy to be here today. We have a great program. This is part two of Orphan Wells. If you missed part one, it's available and I will be sending a, uh, and part one has been posted and I um, have sent an email with the recording, but I will send another email with the recording to that. Also, I will send a re the recording of the part that Mileva Radonik is going to be doing today. She's not able to meet, so she's going to record it um, and make that available with the recording of this part. So this is a part, this is sponsored by the Division of Professional Affairs and also the Division of Environmental Geoscientists. I'm happy to have our, our uh, president of the Division of Environmental Geoscientists here today, Hannes Leiteru, would you like to, um, to say a few words? Yeah, say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd like to welcome all of you to AAPG's Orphan Wells Part 2. The first U.S. well was drilled in Pennsylvania about 150 years ago. According to the U.S. EPA, and these numbers, the EPA and what is real may be different, but the U.S. EPA said there may be millions of old and not properly plugged oil and gas wells leaking methane or contaminating groundwater in the U.S. So it's considered a very serious issue, and the plugging themselves will cost billions. Many of these wells are in urban areas and can endanger residents. In one California field alone, the state will spend $3.3 million to plug 56 wells. Today, we're going to hear about how to plug and permanently abandon these orphan wells. And at that point, I'd like to open it up to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. Really appreciate it. So I'd like to introduce our two speakers, and we'll start with Dan Arthur. We've got Dan Arthur of ALL Consulting, and then we have Nick Giannoussis of, of, of USGS, and we have Mileva Radonik of um, OSU, who will be joining us with via recording um, via link later after the event. So Dan, I'd like to invite you to share your screen and start your presentation. Welcome. Great. So, uh, Susan, thanks for, for having me again. I can tell you that uh, I, I really hope everybody enjoys this. This is, you know, an issue uh, near and dear to my heart. So um, I'll, I'll also say that, you know, we've got just a little bit of time. So um, the, the, the details of this is, is only going to go so far. So I just encourage everyone to keep track of what AAPG is doing, uh, the you know the Groundwater Protection Council, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, and so many states. So, just a couple of weeks ago, the state of Alaska had a webinar on well plugging there and some of the things that they're trying to do. So there's a lot of a lot going on um, to to just just to consider. So I I just encourage. Uh, I encourage everybody to to just pay a lot of attention here. So, what I've what I've tried to do for the presentation is include some um, some kind of uh, pictures that that either we've taken or that uh, has has been available. So, hopefully, you can uh, you can you know take a look at that. So, um, this this first picture on the cover is from uh, southeastern Ohio. Uh, so, uh, this is the condition that uh, that sometimes you you have to take. Um, but as we look into uh, to wells, um, the things that we're going to talk about today is is listed here. Um, but you know, you can see from from the pictures here, these these can be a challenge. Um, PR station. Other contributors include. So, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. So. Uh, so when you when you start looking at that the equipment that's on site uh, at, at the top, but also uh, 
Michael, if you could keep muted, that would be most appreciated. Um, but this bottom picture here is was provided to uh, by a friend of mine, uh, also in Ohio. But what you what you find in some of these in some of these older wells, especially, uh, can sometimes be wooden casing. So that what you see there is is an old uh, piece of wooden casing uh, extracted from a well. It's in a museum now. Um, so you know, as we as we look and and plan for these wells, we you know we need to keep a lot of things in mind. So I'd say the first time is is just really looking at prioritization. So you know, if you look at the at at the data out there, the sources that we have, um, and you know, we we talked about that you know in the introduction to this, but the the data that I've seen. Um, shows that there's in excess of 2 million uh, orphan or abandoned wells um, that have either been a combination of documented and undocumented. So there's still a lot of wells that you that I know we've been to, uh, uh, both myself and, and, and my team have been to that uh, that certainly are on, aren't on anyone's records. Um, so it's it's a challenge in itself. I'll also say that that in addition to these two million wells that we should all also be considering is that there's a lot of idle wells that probably don't have uh, future production potential. Uh, we do a lot of uh, environmental due diligence, and sometimes we've seen cases where the plugging liability for an asset that's being sold is is more costly than the assets value itself. Um, so my hope is that as we get into this plugging and looking at some of the goals here that we can encourage not only these orphan and abandoned wells to, to get plugged or, or reuse beneficially, but also some of these other idle wells um, that, that are around that could be even greater numbers than, than these OAWs. So as we look at some of these that 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 was also alluded to in the introduction, you know, these these wells can can not only be the well itself, but the equipment and old tanks. Uh, in the bottom picture, the tank in the back is an old wooden tank. It's from uh, Leon County, Kansas. Um, there's just there's just an array of different things there, but but these wells they they can include environmental risks, greenhouse gas emissions. Soil and groundwater contam contamination, habitat impacts, uh, and some of the areas, like if you look at, uh, at an area like Burke Burnett, Texas, one of the things that we've seen in, in some of these areas is that, that, that things have been going on so long, the environmental impacts have been going on so long, that you don't just get, say, methane emissions or, or things from an individual well. It could be coming out in the field because there's been contamination ongoing for a long, long time. So just just be cognizant of that. Um, but I would just say that the the federal regulations, the the encouragement, the IRA, its main focus has really been um, reducing methane emissions. Global climate change is such a big deal with everybody now uh, that that that's I would say a particular focus. So when we look at, you know, how do we how do we set our goals? How do we look at at what we're going to try to do uh, and accomplish uh, through uh, plugging orphan and idle wells? You know, we want to first we want to quantify and eliminate any and all emissions, whether it's methane or other gases it could be H2S, could be an assortment of different things through that well plugging process. So. So when you when you do that, that means in your design, your planning, you may need to be using things like microfine cement or resins or or cutting and pulling casings or, or an array of things as opposed to uh, to practices that may have been present uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago. So keep those in mind. There's also the issue of remediating uh, soil uh, and, and restoring native species and habitat that, that may have been degraded. Uh, there's a great uh, documentary that you can find on Netflix called uh, Restorative Agriculture. 
um, and the University of Tulsa does does a lot of stuff with, uh, and and so have we uh, with planting, say, salt tolerant plants to to help where where you may have soils and even groundwater that that have been impacted not only by say hydrocarbons but also salt water. So there's a lot of things to consider throughout that whole process. Uh, we also want to address current and future potential risks. So we can see things in houses, and I'll get to an example of this a little later uh, on wells that, that have been plugged where gas migration wasn't, um, wasn't stopped. And that wound up uh, creating some, some pretty major problems. So we want to make sure that, that the procedures and so forth that we use are designed um, to to address the various issues and that we also test them to show and prove that they have. And I'd say the last thing, and I'm, and I'm gonna say this from uh, a lot of, uh, of, of old guys out there like me um, that are very interested in the historical value and the historical perspective of the energy industry is that what you find in a lot of these places is, is, is equipment like that wooden casing that I showed, some of these old pump jacks that are 100 years old or more, uh, different other different equipment. I know here in my office, I've got old wrenches and wooden sucker rods and, and just all sorts of stuff. But, but trying to preserve some of that history is important to a lot of people. And the reason, part of the reason I bring it up, not, not only do I think it's very important, but one of the things that that happens is you have people out there that are not reporting the presence of old orphan or abandoned wells because they're worried about the history of all that equipment. They don't want that to just get thrown in a, in a landfill. So uh, if you make that a priority, uh, you'll get more help from from locals and so forth and and that that uh, that is certainly needed. So. So this is a this is a an example that uh, a friend of mine uh, that I that I work with one of my partners Tom Thomastic uh, used to work for the state of Ohio, but um, but this is uh, uh, a, a former uh, Clinton production well in uh, in in Ohio that was plugged in 1922. If you look at the old uh, industry documentation from back then, some of the standard. You know, industry standard practices for plugging included, you know, driving wooden plugs and, and, and a variety of other things. But in this case, an old well plugged in 1922 uh, was that was 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 plugged. Nobody gave it another thought. They went in and built an apartment complex in the area and then discovered the well was leaking methane. So they had to put a vent in. But it was it was a rather uh, kind of an emergency uh, process. So. Um, you know what what I would say is that as we do this, and I've seen this done in Kansas and Texas and other places as you're plugging wells, you know do your research for other nearby wells that may be in the vicinity that may not have been plugged to to current standards, and there may be opportunity to to go into some of these older wells, replug them uh, while you're while you're there and doing this so that we don't have issues like this. so, uh, you know, just just considering all those things is important. And I'll and I'll tell you, there's there's a I, we found it that having a multidisciplinary team is just, uh, you know, I can't say it's required, but it really helps in 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 everything. Having a geologist that knows, you know, the geology and a reservoir engineer and a drilling, you know, like guys that can that can put. Uh, those different things together to make sure that you understand the history of how wells were built in that in that time. Uh, you know what what intermediate or deep gas zones might be present, so you have to worry about stray gas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're talking here at AEPG, geology focus, but you really need geologists, engineers, et cetera. So, so if we look at you know at at well locations, this is a, a map from the Environmental Defense Fund, um, you know, and, and we look at, you know, I think they identified something like, you know, 70 or 80,000 uh, on their map. And this is the picture below is from Kiefer, Oklahoma, uh, back in the day. And, and, it, and, and you look at the number of wells out here, and yet none of those wells are, are, 
identified on the map that we have. So, so just keep in mind that as you look at some of these resources, and there's other GIS, online GIS tools, the Groundwater Protection Council is doing stuff with their risk-based data management system to help include this. A lot of states have databases, but a lot of these older wells just aren't there. And they can also vary. And, and, and unfortunately, what I've, what I've seen is in some cases, you know, um, folks don't necessarily differentiate the, the historical wells from the newer wells or say a well in California versus one in Pennsylvania. So they can vary a lot from surface considerations that you have to take into account when you're plugging. Is it rural? Is it by a city? Is it next to a house? The ecosystems, the environments, the geologic settings, the well configurations, all that stuff. You know, we've done some where wells were, were switched from uh, producing oil um, to maybe producing water for uh, other purposes and extracting chemicals or, you know, different sorts of things and, and, and so forth, or maybe converted to disposal. Uh, so there's a lot of things to really understand. So just keep in mind, they can, things can vary a lot by age, by area, by producing formation, by industry practice at that time in that area, et cetera. So those things are key to know uh, as you're creating that, that plan for plugging and, and doing that. So I noted, I made enough, I've really been harping on this thing of really trying to understand uh, the past and history, but they've just varied so much. And when you look at, at you know, now there's, you know, a API has has documents out there, but, you know, some of the early stuff, you know, this, this, the cementing process, you know, um, you know, you, we've got stuff from 1911, 1922, uh, some written by Mr. Halliburton himself uh, on how to do things. Um, you know, when I was at EPA, there's an, another document that uh, that I helped that wound up getting published after I left EPA from API uh, on on well plugging and construction and so forth. Uh, and although kind of geared towards injection wells, uh, it did a lot of great stuff. So just keeping some of that in mind because, you know, you have to remember API wasn't founded until 1919. Most states didn't have the regulations applicable to a lot of this until in the 30s or later. Um, the practices varied. And, and the other thing that, that it's hard for us to think about is if you look and say the, the very early 1900s, uh, when we had, you know, kind of surface casings or shallow casings, they weren't put in there to protect underground sources of drinking water. There wasn't a term underground sources of drinking water even present. One of the big things that that those those casings were was kind of water protective casings because they didn't want water coming out of shallow zones and contaminating oil production zones because it was in the state's interest and 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 so forth not to waste resources. So if water got into there, it would make perhaps some of that oil unrecoverable, uh, which would mean the state's not doing their job. So the focus wasn't environmentally related. It was, you know, taking care of that resource and so forth. So just keep in mind, it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around, but things can change immensely. So we're going to talk a little bit about some plugging concepts. This was uh, some, some snapshots from uh, an Alaska oil and gas uh, Conservation Commission uh, workshop webinar that they did. It was just, I'd say, a very good webinar. Some good stuff there, but looking at, you know, at, a, at a, one of the examples they had was a well that was right off a highway. So I'm just telling you the environments and where some of these old wells are uh, will, will, will often surprise you. And, and as you look at this, you know, and this this sounds this sounds I'm going to say some things that sound kind of odd and, and and so forth, but you've really got to look at risks. So um, if we look over at the pictures, and you know I, I know everybody here can read, but this is another example of wooden casing. The the upper right picture is a well that uh, that had to get plugged under a school gymnasium, uh, you know, in Ohio. So you can see what they had to do. Uh, the, the bottom left picture, uh, you've got uh, a guy uh, that's plugging a well that has to had to put some uh, something on the well to uh, 
so that they can put some sort of wellhead on there and 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 be safe and and uh, you don't always think that hey uh, methane is uh, flammable uh, so it can surprise you and and I'll I'll tell you this is we've we've even had to plug one well that was in someone's basement so you can imagine how interesting that was but these things houses can get built over them or next to them I've seen so many times where you know driveways or or whatever so just just be I would say be very careful and and uh, don't take anything for granted um, because you can have some some pretty big issues uh, Here's another one just, you know, I, I, I alluded to this earlier uh, from 1922. So when you're when you're thinking about some of this, uh, you know, in in that time, the the standard industry practice, the best practice, the you know, the 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 the, the top technology methodology and so forth when looking at plugging is the use of wooden plugs, uh, cement alone, uh, often with a dump baler. Uh, I've used a dump baler a lot in 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 some challenging wells, but but just keep in mind that that things have changed and and we've really got to pay attention to that. So sometimes going back to some of these old wells that were plugged uh, with wooden plugs or something, um, they they need they need help and attention as well. So. And, and more recently, this is this 1992 uh, API uh, study. You can see what's very common is you know cutting casing, putting multiple plugs in. But you but in doing this, you really have to understand the geology. You have to understand you know in 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 areas like West Virginia, New York, Pennsylvania, all of Appalachia. There's a lot of intermediate gas zones that may be overlying. Um, uh, producing zones. It's very common in that region to have uh, gas vents on a water well, uh, as, as you might imagine. So the whole gas migration investigations and stray gas is a really big deal in some parts of the country. So having, a, having a, a, this multidisciplinary team to look at where you need plugs and, uh, and to be able to, to figure out how to best make them um, effective. So in, in this case, you know, we've, we've pulled case in and so forth and, and, and that, but, you know, sometimes you have to have mechanical plugs or, or, or different types of things. So um, when you look at these, these generalities, like a minimum plug length of say hundred feet, that, that may work in some cases, but, you know, in other cases, you may have to, to be significantly greater than that. And, and I'll also say that, you know, you, the use of resins, microfine cement, and other, and other types of specialty cements are a big deal. And the other thing just to consider is the parameters of that cement. So I, I encourage getting lab tests on your cement so that you understand its effectiveness in different temperature environments and so forth. So this one we're going to go pretty quick, but it's just recognizing that stray gas emission potential. So oftentimes we've seen people plug wells, not really think about the stray gas potential and the, the well gets plugged and it's still emitting methane. So what we're gonna talk about in just a second here is if you're gonna look at these and try to take advantage of curtailing uh, that, that those gas emissions, which is a major priority of the federal government and states in 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 going through this plugging effort you may be missing the point if you don't absolutely you know do what you need to do to to stop the methane emissions uh, from these wells as you plug them so you know you can use in in looking at the whole greenhouse gas emission method you can use flare cameras and seeing hydrocarbon vapors uh, on wells that are say leaking uh, there's various groups that have put different types of uh, of containerized uh, uh, equipment to be able to try to measure emissions that way. There's a variety of, of different things in, in, in looking at those. Uh, sometimes it can be a challenge because, you know, you can have wells that are over 100 years old that are out in the middle of a forest um, or, or, or something. So, um, really looking at understanding those is is critical and and i'll tell you from our perspective we really like 
using OGI, which is, you know, optical gas imagery with, say, a FLIR camera or, or equivalent, um, because what we've seen in a number of cases is that by using, you know, using OGI, uh, you can, you may find areas where there may be emissions that aren't necessarily coming directly from the well. It may be coming out of the ground six feet away or, or, or through some pipe or, or, or a variety of different things. So, so I, I highly encourage that as you look at that as a screening tool. You can also use these to help uh, at the end of a plug job confirming that you've addressed emissions. From, a, from wells that, that are, are uh, once you kind of get what's leaking, you, you also want to know what it is that you've achieved um, in, in the potential emissions that, uh, that you stopped. So, so gas flow measurements are, 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 I would say, critical. Um, you can do these in a variety of ways. Um, we really like the alley cat uh, meters, uh, vent busters that are kind of associated with the Well Done Foundation. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't used that one, but, uh, uh, but I understand that it's, it's pretty good. So there's a number of different uh, types of equipment uh, that you can utilize, um, but, but what I would say is, Make sure that you get you, you really need to have um, equipment, whether it's you know pressure gauges and flow meters and so forth that are appropriate for what you're doing. So I remember doing a, a, a stray gas investigation in up in Pennsylvania a few years ago and and I had somebody in the field monitoring pressure and we were looking for like five to ten psi and and they used a ten thousand psi gauge. It just it wasn't appropriate. It's the same thing with these meters. They'll have diff meters with different ranges, so you're going to have to to look at what's most appropriate for the situation that you're dealing with, so that it's within range of and, and appropriate. So, just in conclusions, and I'm, I'm probably taking a little bit more of Susan's time than she anticipated, but but you know the federal federal government has has put 4.7 billion dollars in this orphan uh, well program, and it sparked significant interest. That the I, I would say combined with that, the IRA. Uh, is making notes where you can get carbon or tax credits through uh, through this. Uh, there's a, a a massive need uh, for ongoing research and methodology in locating wells. There's uh, in my first presentation I talked a little bit more about some of the methods on finding wells, but more fully characterizing them, assessing risks, managing those plugging and restoration operations safely. Um, I do a lot of expert witness testimony, and uh, and and I can tell you that there's been multiple situations that I've had to get involved in because somebody got injured or well blew out or or any one of a number of other things or didn't meet the 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 end goal requirement of of curtailing emissions. So uh, you know that there's 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 more work that needs to be done and to be done in that. A lot of states are doing a lot of great stuff right now. Uh, along with DOE and IOGCC and, and others, so so keep your keep your uh, your finger on that pulse because there's some great things happening. So developing best practices, this is something that I'm I'm really pushing. Uh, hopefully, we'll talk about that in a, in another face-to-face -face seminar that we're going to do in Oklahoma City on February 21st. Um, further developing a risk-based rating system. So the Groundwater Protection Council is adding an orphan well. Uh, component to the risk-based data management system and hopefully doing that. That was, you know, the risk-based data management system was initially founded by trying to assess the risks of injection wells through a risk-based approach. And, and they're adding orphan wells to that now. So I'm very excited to see that moving forward. There's a, there's a need for training and information sharing um, and, and even understanding how to, to, to scope things out. So we've seen uh, some mishaps in in that, and and although there's a bunch of people out there that really know this, there's a lot of people that are getting involved that 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 could use help. So the whole measuring measuring methane emissions, you know, for the carbon credit uh, thing, I think you know, I hope that that will allow a lot of well, a lot more wells to be done because sometimes those carbon credits, depending on the well and its emissions and potential emissions, might be more than enough. To cover plugging costs, so I'm hoping that 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 will uh, be an encouragement to to this not only the plugging but perhaps 
uh, alternate beneficial uses of some of these wells that are just sitting there like, uh, you know, like geothermal energy production or injection or rare earth metal production, uh, a number of different things. And, and lastly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a member, a Facebook member of of a, a historical oil field historical group there, and uh, I could t I can tell you that a major uh, uh, priority for a lot of people is just the you know preserving that historical value. Uh, there's a number of groups out there. I'm a member of the Petroleum Historical Institute, but there's museums. Uh, you know, one one of the ones that you know I, I got to pull something out here for the Drake Well Museum. Um, you know that. Uh, there's there's places that uh, that equipment can go and people that would be more than uh, more than help more than happy to help you with that. So if I, I know that we've barely got into this, so my contact information is here. If there's something that anyone would like to discuss or talk about, I love talking about this stuff. So you can reach me here and and uh, and Susan. With that said, uh, I will unshare my screen and. Uh, we can move on. Well, th thank you, Dan. That was wonderful. I really appreciate all the, the in-depth information. Just to, as a note to everyone, uh, we will be having our a, a, a on-site full-day workshop in February, so let everybody know. And our next speaker, it comes to us from USGS in Denver. Welcome, Nick Janutsus. Thank you, Susan. Great, it's sharing. All right, today I'm going to talk about uh, the research that the USGS is doing in relation to orphan wells and the support um, that is available to these programs. So uh, I've shared a number of links in the chat that I'll reference throughout my talk. Um, so let's start with some background. The first U.S. oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania in 1859. And since then, you know, our country has a 160 year legacy of oil and gas drilling and abandonment of wells across the nation. Today, when most wells are, are abandoned, they're plugged uh, with cement, as Dan showed us in the previous talk. Um, but many of the wells throughout uh, you know, the history of oil and gas drilling have not been properly plugged. And these wells are known as orphaned wells. And this can happen in a, a couple of different ways. The first one is that wells uh, drilled before the 1950s weren't plugged with cement. They were often just filled with dirt or even left open. Um, and then companies today in the more modern era can declare bankruptcy and don't uh, plug the wells when they're abandoned. And these wells then become the property of the state, a burden of the state or the federal government or occasionally private landowners. So to help um, you know, try to resolve some of these issues, last year when Congress passed the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, last November, they set aside $4.7 billion uh, to be distributed to the states or oil and gas, or for plugging of oil and gas wells. So that started the uh, Federal Orphan Well Program, which is being run by the uh, Bureau of Land Management. And one second here. Okay. Um, this money is being given directly to the states. About $4.2 billion of that is going directly to the states, and that money can be used for plugging orphan wells uh, for remediate, remediating land and soil and conservation efforts. It can be used for conducting measurements and looking at water contamination and providing info to the public. Um, if you want more information about the actual program, I posted a link to the chat. They have about an hour long webinar that goes through all the details of the program. Um, the important thing is that the money is being given directly to state agencies, state oil and gas commission, and geological surveys to go out and plug these wells. So there is not funding available for private companies or individuals. And the USGS is not part of the distribution efforts of the money, 
but we are conducting research to try to support these efforts. And so one of the first things we did this year is um, right after legislation was passed, they developed a, a methane working group from government agencies, federal agencies that got together and, and published this paper, which is the federal program guidelines for methane emissions. And so if you're kind of new to this topic, um, this is a, a good place to start. It contains a, a brief um, literature review and a background on orphan wells, and then talks a little bit about the emissions process, tendency of wells, and uh, sets some protocols and suggestions for measuring wells as we move forward. Uh, I link to this paper in the chat. Um, so we're very excited to announce that in October, the USGS released the first published publicly available data set of orphan wells across the United States. Uh, which you can see mapped here. This is work that was done by my colleagues, Claire Grove and Matt Merrill. The database contains 117,000 orphan wells uh, in locations with lat long coordinates. Most of the wells have API numbers. Um, and as was mentioned previously, you know, it's estimated by the EPA that there's a million or more orphan wells undocumented across the country. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg, but this is the 117,000 orphan wells that we know the locations and we've documented. Um, so the database was gathered by reaching out to state geological surveys and other agencies and collecting data at the state level. Uh, different states, you know, classify orphan wells differently and have various formats and so uh, the nice part of this work is it combined all the different states into a national scale data set. Here we have displayed the number of orphan wells by state. You can see that Oklahoma, uh, that Ohio has the most at 20,000. Pennsylvania is just behind them at 19,000. And then Oklahoma has around 16,000. And the important thing to remember is that these lists are constantly being updated. So this is not anywhere near the final count. Um, this just kind of reflects a moment in time of the number of known orphan wells. And so these numbers are going to keep going up. States are going to continue to find and document uh, new orphan wells or newly document orphan wells. Um, and so over the next couple iterations, as new data is released, it's possible that, you know, the different states will take the lead. But right now, Ohio is documented the most, um, followed by Pennsylvania. So we've also, uh, this data is, is downloadable in an Excel format, and you can put it into a GIS software. Uh, we've also released a online um, interactive mapper that you can use from your web browser, and I'll give you an example of that here. So I posted a link for this in the chat. It's the same data set using a Tableau interface uh, that with a user interface that you can access online. And here is the 117,000 wells. And so if we click on a well, uh, it will display available information. This is an orphan well in Hale County, Texas. Here's our location, Lat Long, API number, the name of the well, the Ram Sour well. Uh, it was an oil well. And whatever information is available from the states. So this is a quick way to, to see, you know, how many orphan wells, documented orphan wells are in an area, maybe what wells are near you. And when we look at the data, it's pretty interesting that the wells are spread out across the country. Um, you know, most of the wells or most of the documented wells are in the Appalachian Basin where the Marcellus Shale is. We also have a lot of wells in the Permian Basin um, and then the Eagleford, and then a lot of wells in the Anadarko Basin in Oklahoma. We have the Denver Basin with the Niobrara Shale, and then the Bakken with the Williston Basin, and some uh, place scattered around the Rocky Mountains and then in California as well. And so what's interesting about this map is that, you know, when you ask where do orphan wells occur or where are they found, um, the answer is pretty much everywhere where there's oil and gas drilling, which makes sense because the more wells that are drilled, the more likely it is that some of those wells will go on to become orphan. And so anyway, this is just a fun little interactive map and a good way to, to see the wells that we know, knowing that in the future there's a lot more wells and uh, this map's going to continue to be populated.
I turn back to my slides here. So what I did was uh, some analysis of these wells. <clears throat> I took the API numbers from the database, which is publicly available, and I used the IHS market, which is a proprietary oil and gas database that we subscribe to. And I pulled the spud dates for every single well, and I plotted them up here. So on the x-axis, we have uh, the year that a well was drilled in spud, and on the y-axis, we have the number of wells per year. Now, it's important to remember that this is not the year that the wells were orphaned. This is like the birthday of orphan wells. These are wells that this is the year that they were drilled, that they went on to be abandoned. And so looking at this limited data set that we have, um, it's interesting, you know, I'm not surprised that we don't have uh, a lot of information about the earliest wells because those are the hardest to detect and the oldest. And then we start uh, seeing orphan wells around the turn of the century. And then this uh, spike here is actually an outlier or it's a artifact of the data. I went and looked at it, investigated it, and. In the database, a lot of wells that didn't have spud dates simply had 01, 01, 01, January 1st, 1901 as kind of a placeholder. So that's an artifact of the data, but I did inspect the other years and the rest of the data is legit. So we can ignore that spike as an artifact. But we see an increase in the 1900s. And then, uh, you know, what I find interesting is at different times in American history, when a lot of wells were drilled, um, that's when we see when a lot of those wells went on to become orphan wells, which kind of makes sense because the more wells that are drilled, the more likely that some of them will be orphaned. And so in the 1940s during World War II, uh, you know, there was an energy crunch. And then moving on into the energy crisis of the 1980s, that's when we actually see uh, the wells that we know are documented today. That's when the largest years were in the early 80s. And we see a little bit of a drop in the 90s. And then around 2008, we had the fracking revolution. And then we started to see a drop off, um, you know, in the in recent years. And the reason for that is, you know, wells that were recently drilled are still active and haven't been abandoned and haven't had an opportunity to, to be plugged or orphaned. So that's kind of why we see this decrease. I was very surprised to see this many wells in the last decade. Um, a lot of these wells are actually horizontal and uh, especially like in the Bakken, there's a number of orphan wells that are new wells, you know, relatively new that have been orphaned that are horizontally drilled. So I was, I was surprised to see that. So um, the USGS has a, we have a publication that's currently in review that will be coming out in the next couple months. Uh, that will contain a lot of this analysis and further analysis of trends and things we're seeing in the data. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. So moving on to ongoing research, kind of where we're headed as an agency doing this research, is um, the work that I'm looking at is the geologic influences on orphan wells. So for the past few decades, the USGS has assessed oil and gas basins across the entire U.S. And so now when we kind of uh, focus our interest on orphan wells, these wells are drilled in the same basins that we've already assessed. So if this is an orphan well here, you can think about all the factors geologically and the drilling factors that influence uh, methane leakage from orphan wells. So we can go ahead and we can look at, you know, the, the assessments that we've done from the same formations these orphan wells are drilled into. We can look at the stratigraphy with our access to uh, the IHS database. We can look at the production history of well, of wells and well information. Uh, we also have done some studies on produced waters and looking at produced waters associated with oil and gas development as well as uh, the Produced Waters database, with, which measures uh, TDS and other factors in uh, produced water data. So uh, my goal is to take all of this information and take all of this knowledge that we have and we've used for petroleum assessments through the years, and now to apply them to uh, orphan wells and to try to understand what are the geologic influences that, that cause the largest emitters 
and the help and the prioritization of which wells should be plugged first. Um, another research program is, uh, is run by my colleague, Carl Hazy, and this is actually a measurement program. So Carl is developing um, sensors to go out in the field and measure. And one of the things we're particularly interested in is long-term measurement of wells. So currently in the literature, there's a handful of studies by Mary Kang, Amy Townsend Small, uh, Natalie Peckney, um, Stuart Riddick, and um, uh, Patricia St. Vincent that go out and study on the field level and they take measurements of wells. And there's some good papers on those studies. But one of the problems is nearly all of the measurements, there's only a couple hundred measurements that are publicly available. Nearly all of the measurements have been taken at a single point in time. And there was a study done in 2020 by Stuart Riddick from Colorado State who went out and actually measured wells over a 12 hour period, which we can see here in the graph. Um, and each of these colors is a different well. And what he discovered is wells behave very differently over a period of time. And this is only 12 hours, so this is half a day. If you look at the yellow graph and the gray and the black, those three wells stayed pretty constant, which is like, which is how we'd like to think that wells behave. But in reality, there's also wells that do things like this, this blue graph here, where it started off high and then it decreased, or the red one where it was pretty constant and then emissions jumped up. So there's a lot of questions on, you know, how are uh, methane emissions, you know, what is the rate? How does it change throughout the year, throughout the seasons? You know, I would expect that uh, in the winter when the ground freezes, you would see a decrease in methane emissions. And then in the spring when the ground thaws, you know, you'd see a flux of methane coming out. Um, you know, what do weather patterns do? What does a heavy rainstorm do? And so um, some of Carl's work is to go out and set up continuous monitoring systems over the course of, say, a year and to try to get a handle on and try to understand what are some of the fluctuations that we see. So that's work that's ongoing and will be uh, coming in the future. And so just to kind of summarize, um, you know, some of the resources and things we talked about today, you know, Congress has set aside $4.7 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law, the federal orphan well program, which is being uh, overseen by the Bureau of Land Management is distributing those funds to state agencies for plugging wells on state lands. And some of that money is also going to plugging on federal and tribal lands. Uh, the USGS has released the Orphan Well data set, which is available today for download, or you can use the online mapper, uh, which I've linked to in the chat to go through the wells and take a look. Um, I also mentioned the interagency methane report, which has some is a publication that has some information on and background on orphan wells and suggestions for how to measure and and uh, plugging in the future. And then we talked a little bit about uh, the geologic parameters, the work that I'm doing, and then the continuous monitoring. So anyway, I just wanna say thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak today. If some of the things I've talked about complement uh, work that you're doing or vice versa, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd love to get some feedback or hear about opportunities to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. I really enjoyed that. And it was so informative and it's, it's perfectly complimentary to what Dan was saying. Um, we have do have some time for some questions and answers. I uh, would like to point out too, as we go into question and answer, if you need to have uh, professional development hours, we have those available. So I put a link to register for them in the chat. And also I want to remind everyone that you will be getting a copy or an email with a link to the recording of this, as well as the uh, a recording of Mileva Rajanjik, who will be talking about strength of materials and plugging practices. And also I'll have a link to part one. So let's just take a look at, um, at the questions. So um, there's been a question for Nick to put his contact information in the chat. So that's an easy one for him to do. 
And also, Dan or Nick, would you like to tackle any of the questions in the chat? For example, hey, hey Susan, this is this is Dan. So I've been uh, uh, I've been addressing some of the questions in the chat to those people, not necessarily to everyone, but. Okay, want to um, pick out one that some that you think might be the most universal? Um, let me see here. I, mean, I think one of the biggest ones, the early questions was, can you do anything else with the uh, orphaned or abandoned oh. wells? And, and obviously the answer is yes. We had presentations about converting them to energy storage, geothermal, doing uh, brine mining. You might go well, on. I'll so I'll say I'll say this is, and there was another question on on that uh, as well. But you know, realize from what you know what Nick was talking about is we're dealing with say 150 years of history of wells, and one of the things that that I've seen in particular is I've seen um, I've seen efforts go into uh, really researching wells and the, the 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 not only the basin but the play that they're in i've seen wells that were abandoned you know many years ago because they were only producing 10 barrels of oil a day and so in you know in today's land if i could just go get a free well that produces 10 barrels of oil a day i can go in there fix the well uh and uh and and put that thing back on production and at 100 barrels uh, or 100 dollars a barrel uh you know I'm I'm doing good. So there 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 have been a number of old wells that have been uh, taken over from the state, put back on production, maybe fixed in some cases, uh, and and become production wells. Uh, and and I would say the other thing beyond that is depending on the location of this, because consider some of these wells are very close to uh, populated areas. So the idea of of and and may be quite deep and in and pretty good condition. Uh, have the potential for geothermal energy. Uh, some of them, uh, some of them are in areas where there's other things going on, um, you know, in the vicinity that they could be used for disposal. We've seen wells being be used for pr producing water for uh, for iodine production. If you look at the old smack over field in in Lower Arkansas, LA, uh, how they call it down there, um, there's that the 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 smack over has similar lithium content in the water as you would see in the Salton Sea in California. So there's efforts there at, at developing those old wells for, for lithium. Um, and, and I'll say, I see, I see uh, one question here is that uh, someone's familiar with ACR. Uh, are, there, are there other defined methods on, uh, on you know, for, for carbon credits and so forth? And, um, so we're currently working on uh, a, a methodology that varies from what uh, is being used with American Carbon Registry and starting uh, uh, a, a separate registry, and uh, that'll probably be online in, in probably the next 30 days. So there's there's a variety of, of things there, and and I would say that beyond that, even with the ACR, if you look, uh, Europe seems to be ahead of us in a lot of in a lot of areas so there's a company in Europe uh, called Aether A I T H E R uh and uh, you know they're working on on this stuff too so they've been very helpful to us uh so lots of opportunities here e either in repurposing wells for putting them back on production repurposing them for alternate beneficial uses um so the you know we we've got to keep in mind that these are wells that exist that if we can find a good use for them, we don't have to go say drill a new well and 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 spend say millions of dollars perhaps. So so there's both there's there's both concerns here and opportunities. And and I'll say in one case, you know, you know, keep an open mind because you can go say plug a production zone that might be emitting methane, turn around and and recomplete the well into a different zone for geothermal or other purposes. Those are great points. Um, Nick, do you want to add to any of that? Uh, I don't have much to add. 
uh, to what Dan said on that topic. I think a lot of it has to do with, with um, sci having a screening methodology. And I was wondering in, in, your, in the new database, what are some of the fields, the information fields that will be available in the database? Yeah, so they're pretty, pretty basic. Um, or are you talking about the new data report? Or are you talking about the actual data release? Both. OK, so the data release contains uh, location, GIS coordinates, um, API numbers for all the wells, and or I should say most of the wells. Um, so it's pretty basic. And then we're going to look at, in the data report, we're looking at things like year it was produced, um, looking at the depths of the wells, uh, mapping out oil versus gas, uh, mapping out horizontal versus vertical, just kind of dissecting um, the characteristics of the wells. And it's interesting because we're only looking at, you know, what may be 10% or less of all the total wells out there. So it kind of gives us a glimpse of the characteristics of orphan wells. But, um, you know, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. What's, you know, in years to come, we're going to discover far, far more and document more of these wells and we'll learn a lot more about them. Now, I have a question for both of you. A lot of people are attracted to this because of the, e the opportunity, the financial opportunity. And, it, and it's not just in the plugging, getting the plugging contracts, but I guess what I'm, I know a lot of people are wondering, if, for example, you are able to get a contract from the Oklahoma Corporation Commission, for example, to um, you're awarded a contract to plug a bundle of wells, how profitable is that? And and what are some of the dangers? Of, I mean, have you seen people cut costs, for example, and do a bad job? Um, I I can I can make some comments on that. So I I would say that you know one of the challenges with uh, with the state plugging contracts is they're not they're not there for people to become millionaires. So they're they're looking at kind of, you know, low cost wins the contract. And sometimes as you get into that, things happen. They run into unanticipated things, which then drives the cost up. Uh, but it's it it can be a challenge. So what I what I will say is that in in some of the plugging contractors that we work with and in different wells, there's, and this was even mentioned in here in, as, as some of the shortages. So like right now, cement is tough to get. Um, the other thing is that wellheads and, and tubing and, and so forth is very, very, very valuable. So we've seen contractors that have gone into plug wells, they get a minimal amount from the, the state to cover the basics of the plugging, but they recover tubing and and, and other equipment on the site, turn around and sell that, and might make off a single well plugging, might break even on the well plugging, but might make $100,000 uh, by selling that equipment. So there's really, there's, there's, there's a number of things to be, uh, really to be thinking about in this. So like, you know, I, I, I you know, for, for me, I, I have to just kind of open my mind up to really look at the possibility. So I just encourage that. That's a really good point. So that it's kind of like an energy farm. You want to have more than one cash crop. So if you look at your orphan wells, there's the plugging part. If you get a contract, there's the salvage value. There's, a, as you pointed out, the potential for other products, energy storage, et cetera. And also there's the, even like EOR, um, OERB pays for like the cleanup on, of the surface. So I guess you have to take a, as you were saying, a kind of an inclusive approach. So we have time for one more question. You know, we, our time commitment is up. I noticed, uh, Susan, there's a question about, um, <clears throat> it says, do you, do you use near surface geophysics to locate oh, yes. wells? Um, and so I'm gonna post in the chat, there's a study done by the national labs where they were using aeromagnetic data flown with helicopters and going out in historical oil fields and detecting wells and pipelines. Um, so that's an interesting study. Oh, but there's a lot of, 
yeah. there's a lot of interest in that in ways you know some of the wells um a lot of the wells are not visible uh from the surface but you know what are different ways that we can detect them and help document these wells and so that's a big um area of interest as well that's perfect i, I will yeah i will say um as part of the of, of the clean air act program at epa where they've done you know you know done ogi uh trying to look at at, at facilities and so forth they found uh, old orphan wells emitting gas using you know not it wasn't their 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 purpose but they found things kind of unexpectedly where there were you know large emitters Yes, we've had two um, webinars that incorporated some of those technologies, and I'll put a link. Um, actually, we've had more than that, but I'll put the most recent one in the chat. Let's see. And it's kind of exciting to think about it. But there are a number of companies that do airborne with either they can, especially with the um, mounted magnetometers. It, it, they, they work really well, as, and as you're pointing out for pipelines and also for uh, locating locating the wellheads, if, as, as Dan pointed out, if they haven't pulled all the metal parts out. I, I would just say, say this too, Susan, is, um, you know, uh, we have like, we're a small company, 30 people, and we have three, uh, uh, licensed drone pilot. So just keep in mind, um, there's there's actually uh, you know legal requirements out there if you're going to go flying drones around, and you have you have a lot of things to be you know cognizant of. So you know yes, using magnetometers and all that, but some of the issues with with even that those magnetometer surveys is they take a lot of horsepower in processing that data and figuring it out. It's really good stuff, but um, you know, sometimes there could be some good screen tools and, and other things, and especially a lot of times lo the local people will will know a lot of stuff. So, for instance, a company like Marathon, who was Ohio oil company, they've got records from the 1800s that they maintain on on old wells and so forth. So just, you know, keep keep in mind that there's multiple uh, sources to be to be locating wells and, and all of that. So. That's a really and good I, point. And I put my contact information in the in the chat if anybody would like to, to talk further, just reach out. Great. Well, I think we're out of time, but I just want to thank everyone for being here and especially thank Dan and, and Nick for presenting and also uh, Mileva, who's going to be, you'll receive a link to her recorded, pre-recorded presentation. So, Hannes, if you're still here, would you like to say a few final words? Oh, I see Hannes. Oh, good. Here you are, Hannes. Oh, I got my camera pointed different ways. Thank you all for coming to this Orphan Well meeting. I hope you've been enlightened. And remember, there's one coming up in all day session in Oklahoma City, is it? And yes. February. So thank you again. Thank you. This was great. So appreciate everybody's attention and really looking forward to things that are coming up.